Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. It's fantastic to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to speak about my great passion that is 19th century type. But before that, from the introduction, you can tell I'm a designer. And I don't know if you notice when you type designer, a French painter comes out, um, which is, I mean, I'm many things being a designer, but not that. I think I more relate to that icon, trying to manage between running a studio, teaching, also doing the research, maybe having even some, I don't know, social life, meeting friends. So I think that should be the icon of a designer more than the French painter. Anyway, so I'm Italian. Um, and yeah, I use my hands a lot. I'm really happy I don't have to hold the mic. And, but I'll be moving to Seattle in the summer. So yes, that's not the other way around. I'm actually going there. So I'm here today to talk about ugly type. And what do I mean about ugly type? Something like this, that is old, not in a cool way, probably overly decorated, um, not contemporary. Um, and more than just that, I would like to take you to a journey on how I learned to stop worrying. The modernist in me is OK with it now. Uh, and love these kind of typefaces. So like every story, uh, it starts in Milan. Um, well, not every story, my story, like every story has a start. Mine starts in Milan. Um, we are very proud of our metro, as you can tell from uh, postcards from the 60s and 70s. Uh, being born in Milan and studying graphic design there meant that Unimark, Massimo Vignelli, Bob Norda were the masters. So these, these were the kind of graphic design we were studying at university. So uh, that is not called Rand, because even though like half of the pictures of Max Uber on Pinterest seem to say that this is Paul Rand, this is not, this is Max Uber. And if you find a comment under a picture on Pinterest saying that that is not Paul Rand, it's Max Uber, probably it's me, because that's my personal quest. Uh, anyway, um, then Albe and Lika Steiner and their amazing work, uh, the beautiful illustrations by Laura Lam for La Rinascente, um, Franco Grignani, A.G. Fonzoni. So basically, by the end of university, I was swimming in modernist bias, not just. Um, but I was lucky because one professor asked me to investigate a, sp a span of time that is in between two well-known moments of type history. So Bodoni, that was mentioned before, and I will mention again later. So the end of the printer as, as craftsman and the, let's say, the traditional punch cutters till the rise of Nebbiolo, that was um, the main Italian type foundry that became internationally famous in um, the beginning of the 20th century. So basically, I had to investigate what was happening in between these two moments. Um, one thing that you need to know about Italy in the 19th century is that it actually didn't exist. So especially for the first half, Italy was a mix of different states. So that meant that typography was not really booming. It was difficult because of censorship and trade barriers. So what would, let's say, after Bodoni, the situation there was not the best. Uh, it started to become better and better after the unification um, of the country. So this passion of mine started with a dissertation together with Emanuela Conidi. We studied together in Milan. Um, and so I started researching these kind of letters that would, were probably the most far away letters that you can think of comparing to the very beautiful modernist work that I showed you before. So in the beginning, I was totally agreeing with Stanley Morrison that those letters were really, really ugly. But of course, I sort of developed a thing for those shapes. Um, one other thing is that researching that period of time 
is rather difficult because type specimens are not um, that preserved. Those were type tools. Uh, they were used by um, printers and type foundries till they were worn out and probably and ditched and then waiting for the new one. So a lot of research is actually trying to find where the remaining type specimens are. And most of them, like the example that you see here, are damaged because some letters were cut out and so on. Um, another little thing so that you understand a bit more Italy, what was happening there. Um, the point is that not much. Uh, we're very proud of Bodoni because it was internationally known. Then there's a, like a century where nothing was really um, happening there. Nothing, um, the letters that I will be showing you were not completely original design from Italy. So what is interesting in my research, I was reading the memoir of um, Gastoro Barbera, who was a publisher, uh, one of the most important ones in Italy in the 19th century. And he wrote this book that is really interesting, well, for people like me interested in those weird things. Um, but he talks about the process of choosing typefaces for his publishing house. Um, and he was saying that, of course, everybody knew back then in the middle of the 19th century that the best type was, was from the UK. But unfortunately, they were not very willing to sell type to Italy. So he had um, to go f to Germany to find some good type, even though there were type foundries in Italy. So, and we, I found some um, advertisement on type design, type typography magazines that actually say that, for instance, the Bauer uh, type foundry were selling mattresses to Italian founders so that they could cast their typefaces and sell them in Italy. So let's start our journey through the 19th century and let's hope you will change your mind uh, about ugly type as I did. So in the very beginning, of course, we're talking about Bodoni again. So um, very neoclassical layout, very beautiful type, extremely well-designed book, generous margins. Um, we can see in the first specimens of the Amoretti brothers. The Amoretti brothers were punch cutters that worked with Bodoni in the beginning, uh, and they had a huge fight in 1895 because Bodoni was super jealous of his work, and he didn't want them to publish their own typefaces, their own punches. So they had a fight, and they parted. So um, the first type founders in the 19th century were working with Bodoni, and you can tell them, you can tell that um, the style, they were heavily influenced by him. This is a specimen from uh, 1811, and this is a specimen from 1830, and still the style is very much that. But if we have a look at another specimen, for instance, this is from a um, printer in, a, in Tuscany in 1829, the style is starting to change a little bit. So the frame is not just lines, it's a bit more decorative. Of course, the title page is way more decorative, but what is interesting is that we can start to find their fat faces. So first display typefaces of the 19th century. Um, those are very beautiful numbers, by the way. Um, what is also interesting is that the last two pages of this specimen, they show one of the first examples of these kind of letters that are to be found in Italy. And you can tell that the printer was really proud of those letters because they are printed in this super dark black ink that is so dark that you actually, when you flip the pages, it left an impression on the next page and he really wanted to show that he could print those nice letters really well. So in the span of just a couple of decades, we move from now classical layout, very something we can also relate to, to an overly decorated style. Um, this is another specimen, this time from a type foundry, another one of the old ones from Milan called Comoretti. And again, we can see that something is happening with type, more condensed, shading, but nothing really radical. To start to see really radical decorative type, we have to go towards the mid of the century, when Bodoni was not a model anymore. And I will say, thank God. 
Um, and what's the reason? One well, of many reasons, but one we tend to forget is that um, type can also be political. And for publishers of the 19th century, in a century where the Industrial Revolution was happening, where the goal was to produce goods that were of good quality but affordable prices, using Bodoni as a model. So as someone, um, he was working, I don't have any motion, so I'll be the one moving a bit. Uh, so um, Bodoni was the printer of the European royalties. He would exchange uh, books and letters with all the main royals in Europe. And so for publisher in Italy in the 19th century, they were trying to create um, a common culture, publishing books like the one that you see there. Um, of course, they were embarrassed of um, using Bodoni. He was not a model. So for the entire century in Italy, Bodoni was considered embarrassing to refer to. So here we go with lots of decoration. Um, borders become really, really crazy. And then you start to see some very uh, typical 19th century type made out of pearls, very various forms of shading, super condensed, um, crazy things. Um, the point was that in the beginning, the basic shapes of letters, so slab serif, modern faces, were decorated. So the shapes were not changed that much, but it was the, the thick, and thin strokes that were overly decorated. Um, here we have one of my favorite specimens that I found uh, in the north of Italy, in the city of Trieste. And this is a really, well, the opening page is triumphant uh, with, yeah, that's not minimalism at all. Um, so lots of very decorative type. Of course, now I know I'm supposed not to turn my back at you, but I want to see this three times because <laughs> it's really beautiful. Um, so here you start to see what those anonymous uh, punch cutters and letter designers were trying to do. Not just decorate letters themselves, but starting to work with serifs and terminals. So what is really interesting to me about this typeface these typefaces, it's more the type designer point of view. So what were they trying to do? They were trying to catch the spirit of the time, to represent what was going on. And by the look of the typeface, that must have been a really fun time to be alive. Um, and that, I think, is what we need to look at what, you see, what we look at these letters. It's not something that we would use or do now, uh, even though some of those letters um, are probably back in fashion. Um, but it was the crazy experiments that they were doing. Um, like, you cannot say that some of these letters were, are beautiful, but they are incredibly creative and crazy. And if you think of how slow typography evolved um, during the century, and then in a few decades we have these crazy letters um, to me, this is why I really love um, this period of time, and this is also why uh, I'm a bit overly enthusiastic when I talk about it. Um, but we are really the kids of um, 19th century. So more decorative letters. This is Wilman Type Foundry in Milan. Um, this is also super beautiful. So the at the beginning, the basic shapes were not changed that much, but every possible effect and point of view um, were designed. And let's not forget that a lot of decorative type was also rather small, not only large wood type. So what is really fascinating for me is that in this time, we can see these three alphabets that were generated by the same approach to type. The first one is something on top that we can relate. It looks incre incredibly contemporary. And then we look at the second one, and that is, oh my god, that's ugly. <laughs> but those were generated by the same approach to, let's try to experiment. What can we do with letters? Um, 
so if we move to the end of the century, um, the experimentation starts to be more on the letter shapes themselves and how to integrate decoration and letters together. So here you see um, that some letters are modified. There's a um, um, try to integrate also here, maybe uh, you can see it better in the top right, how to make patterns and decoration and letters integrate together. The result might not be at our taste because they are not speaking to us, they were speaking to their contemporaries, but from a designer point of view, it's extremely interesting what they were trying to do, to do and trying to achieve. And to me, the approach is what makes it extremely contemporary, not necessarily the result. Um, so here, this is from Riper, that was a very good type foundry in Genova at the end of the 19th century. They published an amazing, um, sorry again, being overly um, enthusiastic, but this is um, an amazing specimen that is printed perfectly. And try to think how difficult it is to print these very thin lines, very black, in a very consistent impression. So they were really skilled and the type was of course of good quality. Um, then the taste st starts to change, so there are more experiments with different colors, try to create, um, again, a style that integrates decoration and letter shapes and not only overlays decoration on letters. This is something that, I, again, sorry, I'm turning my back again. Um, this, of course, it's not contemporary to us but the experimentation they were doing, this reverse contrast, so that the contrast is not as we would expect from writing calligraphy with a broad nib, but it's, um, well, flipped so that the heavy parts are on top and on the bottom. Uh, and that crazy S, it's very nice and interesting. Not, it's not necessarily something that you would use, but you can see what they were trying to do. Um, or here again, this is one of my favorite pages from that specimen. Um, the Francesca da Rimini that you see on top, again, is so beautiful how they were trying to do these broken stems with the dot in the middle. It's extremely elegant. Would you use it in a project? I mean, you really need the right project to use something like that. But if you find the right project, that's amazing or the one that is all wobbly uh, just below, or the super extended one, or the crazy, um, um, also it's funny that you don't understand Italian because sometimes the things that are written there are quite funny. Um, so, because um, that's a kind of flower and you would say like, I love, I don't know, I don't know how to translate that, but um, it just sounds funny. Anyway. Um, and then we arrive to the turning of the century. And of course, I have to mention Nebbiolo. Nebbiolo was a foundry that became very famous and internationally renowned around, let's say, after World War, Se uh, World War I, and then um, after World War II with the work of Novarese. But it's a very old foundry that was um, very active also from the beginning, from the end of the 19th century. So here you can see some pictures of the foundry itself and a very beautiful super extended uh, sun serif that probably was not designed by them. Uh, those two pages are from a magazine that the foundry issued from the 1880s more or less to promote the typefaces. Um, and that is interesting because I think the exercise of not finding these typefaces ugly, it's even more difficult for our nouveau typefaces because they are definitely not trendy at the moment. So, but again, uh, it's interesting what they were trying to do with um, the weight, trying to condense and having this sort of liquid shapes um, on your right hand side or the more geometric but not too rigid uh, on the left hand side. 
and that was the style. So again, what I think it's interesting from the 19th century is the integration of decoration and type. The two things were um, connected, and it's a pity that somehow, because of modernism, we broke that connection, and it's something that we are trying to do now. Um, but again, the modernist bias, it took me, well, this research into something completely different to get rid of it, but it's something that is still there. Um, Urania, that again ended up being part of the Nebbiolo, because something similar to what happened to the American type founders happened in Italy. So the major type founders in the end ended up all being part of the Nebbiolo. So here again, uh, this is interesting. I like what they're doing, trying to do with weights and rhythm in a very weird way. Um, and that's one of my favorite pages, actually, because um, first, it could be designed in the 90s, like 1990s. Um, second, it's in color, that helps. And third, I don't know if you can see, but in the outline, the kid of the printer with the pencil, we trace the letter as an exercise in writing, and I think that is quite cute. So, in the end, are these letters really ugly? I think the question is wrong. Um, what is interesting is why were they designed by, like that? How can we learn from the approach they had? Um, so, if we look at contemporary typefaces, and I'm really happy mine is not the only talk mentioning that we need more than just some serifs. Um, this is just a selection from Typographica's Best Of. And I think, of course, from a modernist point of view, you can say that some of these letters are ugly, but they are, what display typefaces are trying to do is to catch the spirit of the time. And maybe they will be extremely popular for a couple of years and then be forgotten, but that doesn't make them less important. That's, we need beautiful display typefaces, crazy one, um, loud and, yeah, not just some serifs. So, thank you. Uh, if you are, <laughs> thanks. So, thank you. I also want to thank the librarians that helped me in the research. They are amazing people and they're preserving so much of our history. Uh, librarians love to have people that they can display their work. Um, also, what I showed you is just a little part of the research I'm doing on Italian type foundries. So if you're interested, be in touch. Uh, and also part of it will be uh, um, as part of this Nebbiolo history project, where me and other designers are trying to gather material and interviewing people that work there so that not everything is lost. So again, thank you so much. Thank you.